Hey folks, I hope this show finds you all well. If you haven't tuned in before, my name is Finn Dewar and I'm the host of the Irish History Podcast. Now over the last two months, I've been taking a break from an ongoing series on the Irish War of Independence and that's about to return soon. But during that break, I've made a series of episodes on my favourite historic and archaeological sites around where I live. So these episodes took us to a place called Kilmoog, where we talked about a 5,000 year old tomb, and then Clara Castle, which is just outside Kilkenny City. Then last week I went to Passage East, where the Norman invasion of Ireland began. Now in the coming weeks, the show will be returning to the War of Independence series, and those episodes are completely different. So before I get stuck back into that series, I want to make one more show, like the ones I've been making over the summer. So I get lots of emails asking where I think are the best places to visit in Ireland. People often want to know those off the beaten track but hidden gems of Irish history that they can go and visit. So I decided for this episode I'd get an expert in this area, that's Neil Jackman, onto the show to share his knowledge about visiting some of the island's best locations and many of them are those hidden gems off the beaten track that you won't find about elsewhere. So me and Neil met at a place called Athassel Priory in South Tipperary, an amazing location as you're about to hear. And over the course of about an hour, me and Neil walked around Athassel, these incredible 800 year old ruins that just ooze history. Neil not only explained the history of this remarkable priory that we were walking around, but he also gave recommendations for dozens of other sites that you'll want to visit across the island. Now, while our discussion was supposed to focus purely on these sites to visit, we also wandered into lots of fascinating chapters from the past. It was a really fun episode to record. So whether you want some escapism right now, or maybe get some ideas of where to visit while we still have a bit of the summer left, or just plan an upcoming journey to Ireland, this show will hopefully be the one for you. Finally, to let you all know, I'm still busy writing those episodes on the War of Independence series at the moment. The release date of these is still a few weeks away, so I'm a little unsure whether there'll be an episode next week. I have an idea for a show, but I'm not sure if it'll work, so you'll have to bear with me on that one. So now, let's go to Athassel and meet Neil. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and I've got a pretty special show today. I'm down at one of the most incredible historic and archaeological sites in Ireland and I'm joined by a man that knows more about this and Ireland's past than most. It's Neil Jackman. Neil has been on the show before actually. People might remember just before one of the last shows before lockdown I think it was me and Neil went to Dunmore Cave but I wanted to catch up with Neil now and we're going to talk about places in Ireland that are either well worth seeing if you've got a couple there's a couple of weeks left in the summer so we're going to spell out a couple of places that are well worth seeing like this location we're at today I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute and a series of other remarkable sites around Ireland. If you're listening overseas, you'll still enjoy this show. I think you'll probably be familiar with them. Some of them have uh, been used on film locations. Uh, They're world famous. And then some of them are forgotten gems. But uh, I'm going to ask Neil to introduce himself. uh, First of all, if people may not remember Neil from that other episode we did. Hi Finn, it's good to have you crossing the Lingon River and <laughs> bring you into County Tipperary for a change. Um, yeah, I suppose I have, I'm an archaeologist myself, but I have a company called Abata Heritage and we kind of focus really on helping to connect people to the past uh, by either giving information on places to visit and great archaeological sites to go and see, or by helping communities with conservation and presenting their monuments and such like that. So it's fantastic to be at one of my very favourite sites, which is Athassel Priory, just outside of uh, the village of Golden in South Tipperary. And we're going to talk about a new project that you've uh, just launched recently about mm. how people can find out more about places that you'd recommend and how you kind of talk th- people through that. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Mm. First, I just want to talk a little bit about yourself, Neil. Neil, you're, uh, I think... People might know you off Twitter, but I think uh, it's uh, it would be a generally accepted fact that you're one of the experts in uh, archaeology and historic sites to visit in Ireland. And I suppose that some people listening to you will go, that's an unusual accent. Uh, yeah. Do you want to explain a little bit about how you've, uh, I, I suppose, come to be so involved in Irish history and archaeology? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a bit of a funny one, really. I mean, as you can tell with the accent, it's a bit of a hybrid one after 21 years in Ireland at this stage. But uh, I come from a town called St. Helens, a big industrial wasteland between Liverpool and Manchester uh, in the northwest of England. But I came over to Ireland in 1999 to work on archaeology sites that were being uncovered before road construction, essentially. So it was part of kind of commercial archaeology. Obviously, the wheels fell off that in 2008 with the big crash. So I was always kind of looking at, you know, how do we get people to understand, appreciate and love our heritage, really? Because, you know, that's, I suppose, always been a key focus for me. I, I did a couple of seasons with the OPW at Trim Castle as a guide there. And, do you know, that was brilliant experience because you got to uh, you know, talk about history all the time and almost tailor your tour dependent on the audience. I got to see the way that different people react to different stories and such like that. And, you know, at the start of it, I tried to tell everybody everything about the past. So the poor people who got on my first couple of tours got an hour and a half of the De Lacey family and the <laughs> intrigues of medieval island. By the end of it, I kind of knew a little bit more about how to, to kind of trim down the information, shall we say. But, uh, so yeah, we, we very much focus on doing things like audio guides, itineraries, and I wrote a series of articles for the journal.ie as well, recommending places to go and see around the place. And I did two guidebooks, one for Islands Aged East uh, and one for the Wild Atlantic Way, each one with over 100 sites to go and visit. So I've been incredibly lucky really to, to kind of see a, a fantastic wealth of heritage that Ireland has to offer. I think it's you know, almost unique the amount of it that we have so accessible to people as well. But with that, I think uh, what kind of always interested me is, you know, I never, starting out in commercial archaeology, and I didn't come to this really, although I did a degree in archaeology uh, back at the University of Wales, I didn't necessarily specialise in one particular period. I was always more interested in the story and the place and how to communicate that. And with that, I... I you know, I also had the opportunity to, to do a bit of lecturing at UCD in archaeology in the public. So that kind of how to connect people to the past has always been the number one priority. And after that, really, it's always about a sense of place and understanding the landscape around us and why certain towns flourished, certain towns disappeared. You know, why certain sites are left like this one in magnificent ruin, whereas other sites are, you know, still being used in one way or another. So all of these kind of big stories and such, uh, you know, I, I, I think... I'm, a, I'm kind of interested in all of that sort of stuff. That's a very long-winded way of answering the question, so I apologise for that, but there we go. <laughs> Maybe to start introducing people then to mm. one of these sites, I'm just going to set the scene for people at home. This is recorded in August 2021. It should be the height of the summer. When I met Neil up on the road away from Athassel Priory, Neil described it as a grand soft day. And that's been very generous. The, the, the rain is pouring down. What we're looking at is an incredible site. It's a medieval priory. Now, I thought I had been here before. I don't think I have. As I came here, I didn't recognise it. It's this enormous, um, extensive priory that was built in the 13th or, uh, century, I assume. But what I know of it is that it was associated with um, the de Burr or the Burke family. And if you've listened to the, this series Fatal Feuds, one of the main figures mentioned in that, the Red Earl of Ulster, Richard de Burr, was actually buried here in 1326. So for me, I always had this um, association with it. But maybe what I'm going to ask Neil to do is to walk over now to the Priory to show me around and to show you at home around. And as we walk around the Priory, we'll also be talking about other sites we'd recommend uh, checking out. But um, we've got about a 50 metre walk. And I just want to ask Neil as we walk over. Um, Neil, you've started, first of all, I'd say to people at home, check out uh, Abarta's uh, website. There's a lot of audio there actually as well. If you're looking, I think everyone these days is looking for more audio. There's never enough podcasts to listen to. There's lots of content there. Mm -hmm to listen to, but Neil, you've started a new kind of, I suppose, program, is that the word, right word, or a feature on the website? And yeah. Do you want to explain a bit about that? Well, you know, again, it goes back to the focus on making the story of all of these incredible places accessible to people, you know, and it, when we started out the company, that was something we were primarily focused on. We get ended up doing an awful lot of kind of services work, working with different county councils, national bodies like the Heritage Council and so on, and that's been brilliant. But we always wanted to get back to helping tourists and people who are interested in visiting places to understand it. So we started something um, which is like a membership 
sort of subscription service, if you like, which has all of my favorite places to go and visit, information on all of those, coordinates, practical information, and the story of the site. You've got itineraries for if you want to go around the Causeway Coast, for example, or if you want to go to um, the latest one is Connemara. Um, an online course on Irish archaeology, and we'll be adding a lot more courses as we go as well. So it's a lot of information, and it's for, um, I suppose, those people who kind of really like to dig deeper into the stories, really, that, you know, they're not necessarily just looking for you know, the Rock of Cashel and Tick the Box have gone and seen that. They're looking for something a little bit different and a little bit more uh, off the beaten track, like this place. <laughs> what I'd also recommend about this is that I'm sure lots of people at home listening to this have gone looking for an archaeology or a historic location and you spend mm. half the day driving around it. Yes. And then you find that <laughs> yes. eventually yeah. this takes out all that. You get to see yeah. it, you get to see also the... You're not rooting around for history. I think also, I actually find that a lot at the moment. If you look at it up a site online, yeah. you have to wade through a lot of uh, rumours and mythology. Of, yeah, and there's like, a lot of nonsense out yeah, there. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff where one site would then copy from another site and copy from another site. And then it yes, kind of, yeah. you know, and I kind of got a bit tired of seeing that. And I thought, yeah. well, let's get back to what the, the actual stories of the places are. And um, the other thing I thought that, would be a good opportunity to address is that there's an awful lot of these sites and the, we kind of built this search engine for it so if you want to find a site for example that's wheelchair accessible or okay. a site that's a good place to bring your dog for a walk or a site that's good to bring uh, little kids who are under 10 we've got it so you can actually search for all of those different things and combine searches as well so if you're looking for a site in Donegal that's wheelchair accessible and good to bring a dog you'll be able to find that rather than just filtering and reading through endless posts, you know, um, because I think the accessibility of our monuments is something that we've not really addressed. There's an awful lot of sites that aren't accessible, like this one, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot there are too, you know, so it's about trying to help people, um, all different types of people, be able to enjoy the story of these places and, and the magnificent scenery as well, which goes along with it. But you're right about the directions. We've done the hard work in terms <laughs> of getting lost <laughs> endlessly trying to find them. So I've got really good tight coordinates for the best place to park and then walk up. And, and what's the URL for people? Uh, so if they go to our website, which is abataheritage.ie, they'll see there's a new section on there called Tour. Or if they go to tour.ie, that's T-U-A-T-H-A dot I-E, um, they'll be redirected straight to that page then as well. Yeah. The, uh, I'm going to come back and ask you for a few recommendations later on. What yeah. we're going to do now, though, I have to ask you about this site. As I said, yeah. I am only familiar with this, I think, from, I suppose, a purely historical point of view yes, and yeah, specifically yeah. about the Burke family. But uh, just to explain to people at home, we're standing at what would, the edge of what would have been uh, the Priory, probably I'd say we're looking into the main the Cathedral Church of us. Um, yes. yep. But it's, I suppose, almost a Gothic feel about this building in that like it's, 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 it's uh, yeah. these huge walls that have clearly seen better days. But can you uh, tell us a bit of the history of this building? Yeah, it. I mean, it's a really interesting one. I've got to say, you know, like it, it's funny because we were talking before you being a Kilkenny man and me and an adopted blow into Tipperary. I think this is the grandest medieval priory <laughs> that we have in Ireland. You know, Kells Priory has a, a good a good claim against it too. It's huge. I mean, it was founded by William de Burgo in and around about 1200 AD. And in fact, there's a de Burgo moss on the other side of the river. We're right on the river shore here. So it was a very, you're in very good land. You're in uh, a very kind of... Um, accessible land from the river and this was a key place for them the he founded it in about 1200 and it was dedicated to St Mary and St Edmund which I think is really interesting because St Edmund is a very English saint you know and I think maybe that was a bit of a kind of reminder that the de Burgs were of where their loyalties lied <laughs> or laid to some degree uh, there's not many places dedicated to St Edmund in Ireland for sure so the site after it was founded in about 1200, um, this became, uh, and the reason it became so significant is, is essentially became the de Burgh mausoleum up till the 14th century. You know, this is where all the grandees, uh, as you mentioned, Richard de Burgh, were laid to rest in here. So they were the key patrons of it. It had a, a town that actually developed around it. And you could tell the significance of the town in a couple of ways. One, it was allowed to have 
uh, a fur day, I think, for seven days a year, okay. which was hugely significant. As you know, you know, I think Dublin only had 15 days a year, you know, so that was important. And there was also grants to King Edward, I think he was raising funds for some war or another. He was always at war, <laughs> Edward I. And I think this gave half the money that Clonmel and Feathered did. So it seems like the town might have been about half the size of Clonmel and, and Feathered at the time. So it's very significant settlement. And just before we actually go into the Priory or the, mm. itself, you can kind of see what are probably ar archaeological features yes. in around us here, which yeah. I assume this is the, the, the last remains of the town in, in yeah. the fields around us here. Well, I think the town kind of spread out even beyond uh, our, our grounds here. So we come along, there's actually, you go through this amazing uh, medieval bridge and through a gatehouse along a medieval road. And you can see all of these bumps where these other buildings live. So. We're within the precincts of the Priory here, so I think these are probably to do with um, the running of the Priory. There could okay. have been a domestic quarters in here, but there could have also been things like, you know, practical stuff, like where the blacksmith was, where the stabling was, and all of that kind of thing. The main settlement, I think, was just outside of the main area here. And in fact, there was a fine given, there was a particular for where there was a fine given to the people of the settlement because the commoners were mingling with all the lords in the fur. <laughs> you know, they didn't like that. So they find the local people here. So there might have been a little bit of uh, friction between, in some ways, between the, the priors and the community that essentially sprang up around it to service the priory. So, I mean, it's a hugely impressive Gothic abbey uh, priory. You can see there's lots of little features around with where statues were and all of this kind of thing. But as we go through, uh, one thing that you notice is it's not in brilliant condition today. Yeah. It, it's, you know, there are plans, uh, there has been a conservation management plan, which was done maybe 10 years ago, and I'd love to see some work carried out. But it's such a big, such a difficult site. It's one of those that, you know, you could throw millions at and you still yeah. wouldn't get. Yeah, it definitely has that. Like, needs. Uh, yeah. Just for people at home, I suppose sprawling is the word. Sprawling. Like it's a huge uh, site. What we're going to do is we'll head in just to highlight to people at home. Um, I will put the, the coordinates to get here in the show notes. As Neil said at the start, it's accessible, but if there's any mobility issues, it's not really like, for example, we're about to cl uh, climb over a stile on a on a, a wooden fence. So if there is mobility issues, this probably isn't the site. But we're going to talk about other sites uh, throughout the podcast that are. So Neil, do you want to lead the way there over the stile? and? Yeah. Uh, I'd say we can, we can leave the mics on. Okay. So we have moved in uh, through this what? Is the nave now, the nave of the large priory church, and we're going to go into. I think you know what? Let's go through the cloister area. Okay. It's very impressive uh, because I want to show you the biggest blocked up arch in Highland, okay. which sounds like a bad claim, but it's true, and you will be. Impressed. There's a bit of a Father Ted quality to it, <laughs> <laughs> but I love claims like that, you know. <laughs> Just to describe to people at home, if you've seen any pictures of a medieval priory, you've probably come across uh, pictures of the cloister. This was generally a square feature in the centre of the priory, which uh, would have a partially or fully enclosed uh, walkway around the edge of this, and then often a green area in the centre, I suppose, yeah. associated with contemplation. Uh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. That's it. So they, they would walk around it. And, and one thing as you're walking around the, the cloister, the cloisters, you know, some of the um, cloister arches are still in pretty good condition. We're missing quite a lot, but it's these small details. And, you know, we'll, I, I, I'll give you some images for sure so you can see them. But there's these beautiful uh, sculpted foliage around door arches. You know, the amount of skill and craft and masonry work that went into something like this was absolutely enormous. You know, this is generations of patronage from one of the richest families in Ireland. And it really shows in the quality of the sculpture that we'll see. One of the things that I really like about a site like this is um, we often kind of think about the medieval world and obviously it's a distant and ever more distant place. I think even the last 20 years, the development of the internet puts even further distance between us. But I think when you come to a site like this, you can start to get some sense of at least what this landscape may have looked like 700 years ago. You can see this building, even today, it's in a ruin, as we said, but it yeah. still dominates all the landscape around. You can also see, though, and we're talking about a very privileged uh, group in society, um, 
uh, the people who would have lived in and around the Priory, I think. But still, you get a sense maybe of what the world looked like. Just even if it's a, a, in that famous title of uh, Barbara Tuckman's book, a, a Distant Mirror. But I think yeah. coming to places like this, you do get this, the image of what a medieval landscape may have looked like. And I, yeah. that's what I would recommend if you're listening to this at home. One of the reasons to come here is for that alone. Will we head in? Yeah, we're going to head in, in there now and, and we'll see the famous arch in a moment. Wow. Okay, actually, I take back what I said. <laughs> it is I'm looking at a huge arch that has been... Uh, bricked up and it's almost, uh, I wouldn't say threatening, but it's like, it's imposing. That's the word I'm looking for. Imposing is right. Yeah, it, it's just in the crossing tower though. And there's actually a later doorway inserted into it. You can only imagine what that actually looked like in when you first saw that. Um, you can also see the difference in floor levels as well. If you see where the base of the columns are. Oh yeah. I think what's really special about a thassel is if you're in any way interested in understanding kind of construction techniques and phasing and different types of medieval stonework, it's got it all here. Yeah. And because all the plaster's missing, it's kind of the bare bones of the building, you can see the stone. You can see endless amounts of blocked up doorways and where they've changed their minds about how the building should work to suit yeah. them over time. That's right. There's something I just wanted to look at in here in that there's relatively modern graves. There are in the nave for sure. And I so has it yeah. got a, a contemporary history? It ha well, I think I, I'm not sure are the people still allowed to be buried here in some of our historic sites you'd see that certain families, and in fact, the Rocket Ashley included, certain families are allowed to be buried in there because that's where the families have always been buried. Um, how, do we know how long those traditions, like are we talking centuries or even? Oh, they can go for centuries, but in, in some cases, like I was on a place called St. Moog's Island in County Cavan, and um, the la very last person who had the right was about to be buried out oh, there wow. so, okay. so that that's the end of it once that generation kind of goes kind of thing that's it so there's not many people with permissions to do it but there are some relatively recent graves uh 20th century graves in the the nave here the, i i really find that uh I don't know that where it provides continuity. You know, yeah. you talked about how this was built sometime around the year twelve hundred, and mm. directly in front of us there's a grave from two thousand and seven. That's right, yeah. And yeah, I guess that that even though it's as a ruin, as we've said now mm -hmm. a few times, people still come back to this. It's still important in the landscape, you know. And there's it something. It is. It, it's funny. People's connection with sites and places, I think, is really interesting in that way. I mean, there's the straightforward explanation that it's holy ground, you know. Um, but at the same time, I think if it's a place where families are interred and, uh, and things like that, you know, it has that pull. I, and I'm not sure, is it easy to explain that in a, in a kind of rational sense, but it's certainly a feeling that, you know, community seems to go on in some sense or families continue after <laughs> death. I would definitely uh, recommend people at home uh, to come and check this out if you can this year I suppose I would imagine after September it probably becomes uh, quite the feel down is quite mucky it's probably not an ideal site to, to come visit in winter it's it's not great on a wet day um, <laughs> like, as I can testify <laughs> at the moment <laughs> it gets if it's been raining for like uh, even if the day you're going is quite sunny and it's been raining for the week before I'd maybe leave it a couple of days okay. to dry out it does get very sodden that field crossing it and sometimes there can be cattle in the field as well it's not always great to bring a dog for example and such but it's one of those sites that you generally kind of have to use Itself. there's not many people come out to see it sure Al although we're, i think 15 minutes from the rock of cashel which gets 400,000 visitors a year or 300,000 visitors a year like it's, 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 it certainly is on a par like it with is, the yeah. it's got a different history yeah but like in terms of if you want to go to somewhere to kind of wander around and explore mm -hmm. this you, you're certainly freer here to do that than yes. at the rock Speaking of weather, a site that I really want to ask you about, Neil, somewhere I've never been, somewhere I've always wanted to go, is Skerig Mihil. You've been there how many times? Three. No, so can you explain just maybe to someone at home who doesn't know anything about it, yeah. what it is? Yeah, it, it's, it's an extraordinary place. It's one of, Ireland only has two World Heritage Sites as we speak at the moment, although the, there's petitioning to, to have that number increased, which it should be. Um, and Skellig Michael is one of them. It, it's unique. It's very, 
nothing I can say now will conjure even a tenth of the feeling of actually seeing it. it it's an island monastery, which is about 50 minutes in a boat off Bullis Head in Kerry. It's um, right out into the middle of the Atlantic and you've got these two jagged islands, like old teeth sticking up. And one of them has one of our largest Gannet colonies on, that's Little Skellig. And right next door, you've got the island and there was a monastery founded the probably 7th, 8th century originally to St. Fionan. It eventually got rededicated to uh, the Michael in, I think, the 12th century. But you have this small monastery with clacons on it. You have um, a series of steps. It's about 700, 600 and something anyway, steps that lead up to it almost vertically. It, it got into the news and it got into the popular imagination the fairly recently when it was used in Star Wars. That's where Luke Skywalker was hanging out as, uh, you know, that was his Jedi refuge. And it, uh, honestly, it kind of has that otherworldly feel. The reason I'm sort of obsessed with it, apart from, I do love early medieval archaeology, but the reason I'm obsessed with it is because I am absolutely crazy about puffins and it has 7,000 resident puffins. <laughs> <laughs> so now they're gone at this time of year. They, they go in kind of early enough August back out into the Atlantic. But we were there recently. We were there in June, or July, sorry, at the start of July. And it was a really misty day. So all the views were gone, but that meant all the puffins were home. So you were almost kind of nudging them out of the way on the steps with your foot so you can carry on walking. It's the most incredible experience you'd get. It's beautiful. It, it's stunning. It's not a, that easy to access, I suppose. It's so if expensive. people are listening to, that, to this, uh you know, in August 2021, or mm. we're, 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 I suppose, let's talk about times of the year you can go there. Yeah. Um, I've never been, uh, as I say, but it kind of, it is, if you're not familiar with it, again, I'm going to put um, links uh, up on the show notes. I'd really recommend checking out photographs of yeah. the Skelligs. They are really incredible. Like it's, it's, as Neil says there, like he just, as I, I, I'm just talking about having uh, seen photographs, mm. very otherworldly. But obviously to get there, you have this 50 minute boat journey and that yes. does restrict access. It does. And, and there's, they're only allowed to bring so many people a year. So it is quite expensive now. Actually, I first went in 2013 and it was about 45 euros a person. Okay. And now after Star Wars and everything else, it's up to 100 and they're talking about putting it up again per okay. person. So it's got viciously expensive uh, because demand is so high. Um, now, the tickets go on sale. There's a few different boat companies where you can buy um, passage. And uh, it's worth keeping an eye on them because tickets go on sale in March. It generally sells out for the whole season within a week easy anyway. It, they sell out incredibly fast. But a lot of people, and particularly this year, if you're listening in Ireland... Uh, a lot of people from America and so on might have bought tickets with the expectation of coming over and then because of coronavirus and everything else, they can't come over. So there's always cancellations. So there are two forms of tour you can generally take. Most of the boat companies offer. One is called an eco tour and that's where you just go around the base of it in the boat, but you don't land. And that's still a great experience, uh, but the landing tour is the one you want. And so it's always worth checking out that. And I, I see I've... Um, uh, a little article on it on our site that people can read for free and that has a couple of links there for different boat companies and stuff it's just worth kind of refreshing that every week or so and see if there's tickets available this time of year as i say the the puffins are gone but it's still one of the most special places i think on the planet and it, you know you'll still see a lot of you know kitty wakes and great black back gulls and you know gannets and all of that so you've got this incredible sense of the wild atlantic and the natural heritage of that with this otherworldly place. Um, I, I think it was George Bernard Shaw said it doesn't belong to any world that you and I live in. You know, it, it really is. It, it's hard to kind of conjure the impression of it. it it's just stunning. It, it's beautiful. It does. You also, like, again, I'm just talking about looking at photographs of, mm -hmm. of it, but you get the sense of why monks were drawn there, yeah. you know, looking for this kind of, um, I suppose, 
it's almost, you know, I've, I've seen people talk about it before where how it was kind of, uh, the asceticism was influenced by people going into the desert. Yes, exactly. And that going to yeah. an island like this way off the coast. It's a similar enough it is, uh, that, location that they were going to be there and there was not going to be a lot else going on <laughs> other than <laughs> praying, <laughs> praying yeah, you know. Half, so half life. I mean, that that's it exactly, Finn, yeah. I mean, it, it, that was, our oceans are our desert, you yeah. know, in a sense. Um, now, they actually lived not too badly. Uh, fresh water was always a difficult thing, but there was enough rainwater uh, collected in these large cisterns up there that you'd see on the island. But they did feed off the seabirds and the eggs of them, you know. They did have um, trips in and out. Um, the one thing I think that we tend to forget about early medieval islanders, these were very connected people. They were very connected not only to the mainland, but also to other places as well. But there was this feeling of hermitage, of you know, that's why you get place names like Desert or, yeah. uh, and, and things like that. It does reflect the desert kind of thing. So, and, and there was also kind of this idea as well that they were almost like, for them, the devil was a real thing and he was constantly trying to go in. And these were almost like lighthouses, centers of prayer, protecting the island from, you know, incursion by this kind of evil malign force and such like that. So there was, there was a real belief in that sort of stuff that we, we perhaps don't give enough credence to these days uh, in some ways. The, um, and maybe we'll continue if uh, the Skelligs are off uh, the coast of Kerry. Mm -hmm. If we continue up the west coast, you mm. talked about how you've just got a um, something on Connemara. And yeah. So don't just talk us through because Connemara is, like, I think, I, I don't need to explain Connemara to yeah, anyone. It's magic. Yeah, magic. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah would, a couple of sites maybe that you would recommend. Yeah, sure. I mean, we put together this itinerary. It's just like a map and a load of uh, information on, on different places, maybe about 12 places, I, I think, on it. So a lot of people, when they go to somewhere like Connemara, it's a stunning landscape. Yeah. The sites are kind of, fairly well spread out you yeah, know, yeah, and yeah. some of them can be a little hard to find now Kyle Moore Abbey for example a lot of people would know it's this gorgeous kind of uh, 19th century uh, structure built by this uh, Manchester cotton merchant and it is beautiful it's stunning but for me some of the special places are like on Omi Island okay. and you can cross to that when the tide's right there's a sandbar you can drive or walk across the sandbar and hidden away at the back of the island, there's this medieval church, which has kind of been formally swallowed by sand dunes, but oh, well, uh, okay. it's been exposed again now. Um, and it's, uh, again, it's one of those really unique kind of special places. It's just beautiful. There. Um, there's lovely megalithic tombs like at Knockbrack. And there's, uh, for people who are kind of interested in communications and industrial heritage, there's places like Derry Gimler Bog as well, which is where Marconi set up the first kind of radio transmitter and all of that where Alcock and Brown landed actually the first people to cross the Atlantic in a plane they landed at Derry Gimler Bog and they've got uh, information and stuff about that there so there's a lot to see in Connemara it's just about kind of knowing in amongst the landscape I think that's it and what we were talking about earlier like mm. what you're providing is yeah. like you know because I think in the 21st century, we're all busy people. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we don't have that time to spend an afternoon looking for somewhere. No. Or, you know, it's, it, it, our holidays are are, yeah. are are very finite. And I think it's about maximizing the most out of our free time, I think is what. But that's it. And do you know what I, I always hated as well, Finn, was that feeling that you drive across the country to go and look at a particular site and you get back home very pleased with yourself. And then you find out there's somewhere either just I, I, better yeah. <laughs> right next door, two minutes up the road yeah. that you just didn't know about. Or, you know, there was something else special that you could have seen along the way. And I often think that um, when I see people kind of, you know, getting on the big coach trips straight down to, they come down to the Rock of Cashel, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and they're passing wonders on the right yeah. and left. And then they're back on the coach and they're away again down to Cork or Kerry or somewhere like that. And, you know, that's grand, but if you want to spend a little bit longer and you really want to get under the skin of what Ireland has to offer, I think the best thing to do is to kind of look at an area and try to slow down and try to spend a little bit of time in that particular locality. You know, if you are going to see the Rock of Cashel, for example, come up the road and see a thassel. Yeah. You'll have a different experience. You'll see some of the similar types of things and it might reinforce some of the stories that you'd heard previously at the Rock. Um, but you'll get these kind of really rewarding moments, I think. There's nothing like sitting in a place, nobody else around, eating a picnic and yeah. looking at spectacular, you know, statues or, or, or big Gothic buildings. I think it's also great to do that. And um, I think while obviously when you go to guided sites, this is not a guided site, but when you go mm -hmm. to guided sites, 
it's great to hear mm. the expert history. But I think it's also nice sometimes to be able to, you know, find yourself in that building, locate yourself in a building yeah. that you can't do if you're on a guided tour that you have to keep moving. You're on the someone behind you, someone ahead of you. Yeah. You can you know, appreciate, for example, the church. Yes. Stand in it and go, wow, this is the size of this. Uh, and I think that is something you get in a place like this. And just to say, people, we're still wandering around into, <laughs> into various different... Um, uh, sorry, Gwen, yeah. No, no, I mean, you're so right. I mean, if you think of some of our major sites, and, and they are completely wonderful places, like Newgrange, for example. I was just going to, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you, sorry, Gwen, yeah. You know, that that's a really special experience, but you can only enter the interior with a guide. You've only got so long in there, and then you're back out again. But there are other megalithic tombs that you can go and kind of sit in and, and get a little bit of a feel for there's but, four knocks in north county dublin yes is four, that a, i don't know if that's open at the moment it is it now four knocks is one of those where you have to know the right person that has the key yeah. to go and find and it's not the person who lives next door who must get really annoyed by people <laughs> <laughs> tapping at the door every 10 minutes um but that is a really special one now that has got some very interesting megalithic art in and but the oldest depiction of a human face or isn't it, it, it it's questionable whether okay. it's a human face uh, you know, with megalithic art, a lot of people try to try to make claims for what its meaning is, and it's very just to maybe explain or mm -hmm. give people a sense of dates here. We're talking about art from like four five thousand five, years yeah, old. Like, really, so we're talking yeah. about yeah. people who have very different conceptions of exactly. the world, exactly, and, and what art is. Yeah, I mean, they, they had such a different culture to hours, you know, it, it's very hard to see. So you see people make a very grand, grand claim saying that's definitely a map or that's definitely this and that's definitely mm. that. And a lot of it is we bring our own selves into our interpretation yep. and what we want to see, you know. Um, actually, one of the my favorite sites, uh, and unfortunately, I think it's closed just this year for conservation works, is Loch Crew. Okay, yeah, it is actually, yeah, I was talking to, I was actually going to do a show oh, up okay. there because it's, Loch Crew is an incredible, even yeah. the landscape actually, like Amazing. now there is uh, tombs mm -hmm. there that you, and in other years you can actually go inside and I think, mm -hmm. like what we're talking about there, some of those sites are just a bit, like Loch Crew is very famous, but not yeah. as famous as Newgrange. No, no. So you do get, you know, a bit more freedom, I think, in yeah. terms of when you're inside the tomb there. Oh, it's it's incredible. I had such an amazing experience there the first time I went up there. Now, it, the, there's a series of tombs across a load of hills there, and, and there's only really one cluster of them that is accessible. The rest are on private land, and the landowner doesn't tend to welcome visitors, which is fine, you know. So the one of them is called Kern T, and it's full of the most spectacular megalithic art. It looks like foliage. It looks like, you know... Um, some has been interpreted as sons, but as I say, you, you can never 100% be sure. But that used to be at the time where you would go down to, uh, there was like a garden centre, I think. You'd leave them a 50 euro deposit and they'd give you a key attached to a torch. And the torch had like a little crank handle. And you'd go in there by yourself, crank up the torch, and you'd just be sitting in a 5,000 year old tomb with nobody near you. Do you know yeah. anywhere near you? Having that sort of experience, I think, I don't know. It, it's it, it's it, it's something meaningful. I think it, it's very it's worth spending that little extra time and effort to go and seek out these places. Uh, now, the important thing to say is that not all sites are accessible in terms of not only as we said earlier about physically accessible, but certain sites might be on private land. So it's always worth kind of checking out or asking the landowner if you're not sure. You know whether you can get out into it or not. But a lot of the kind of major sites, particularly the ones with signposts, you're fine to go and see, you know. So if you're not sure and, and you see something locally nearby, just maybe ask around, I would say. And as we're moving towards the end of the show, I just want to maybe do a bit of a roundup. But before we go into that, again, just talk us through the new project that you mentioned earlier on in the show. Because mm. as I say, I found it uh, fascinating because it is that thing that, um, you know, I think it's really missing in yeah. Ireland in that we have such an extensive amount of sites. And I think compared to, you know, the fact that we can just walk across a field into this incredible site that we're in at the moment. Yeah. But also sometimes it can be under, like finding a thassel is not necessarily that easy. No. So like, is that the kind of, you touched on that earlier being the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, 
So the idea behind it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's funny because, you know, if you're unlucky and you put a Thassel Abbey into Google Maps, it sends you to the wrong side of the river. So you end up looking across at it with no idea of actually how to get anywhere near it. So it was a combination of wanting to, to give the best kind of practical information of how you actually get here, along with the, the real story of these places as well. And, you know, doing things that help people to understand the context of these sites too. So like the, you know, the course on, the first course that we've put up there is an introduction to Irish archeology. span So we kind of show all of the, the sites and the kind of the meaning, why they're there, why they look the way they do, the way that people thought back then, as far as we can understand it. And the methods and techniques that we use in archeology span to understand and extract all of this information. So, you know, it's, I suppose what I try to, the people I'm trying to serve with it, I suppose, are those ones who, have that kind of hunger to learn a little bit more and it's not necessarily a case of just going all right yeah i've seen the rock cashel today and and that's it i'm done you know they might be interested in well i want to stay in the burren for a week okay and what's around me here you know and and what can i go and see and and what can what kind of stories and experiences can i enjoy from that and from people overseas, is it like a, is it something that you can use, oh, uh, yeah. I suppose, from a distance? Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. So uh, we, it's, we've got kind of, uh, we're building virtual tours and virtually in the sense of uh, with a cameraman following me around the site, explaining yeah. what the site is and its story and that not one of those kind of very <laughs> fancy <laughs> VR jobs. We haven't got the budget for that just yet. Um, so we're kind of doing tours of places like that as well. Uh, and it would be great for if you wanted to come over to Ireland and you know, it's very expensive to come over to Ireland from the US. And if you're spending a few thousand bringing a family over, you want to make sure that you got the right yep. information, a place to go and see if this is the kind of thing you're interested in. And plus, you know, there's, there's you know, 20 years experience of visiting sites around the country that's got to go into it. So it'll be added to the whole time. It's one of those things. It's a bit like Netflix in a sort of sense for real nerds, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to keep adding and building on it and, and you know, uh, developing it as we go as well. It's going to become kind of our main focus. To wrap up, Neil, will you give us a, I'm going to ask you for a couple of good sites for yeah. people to hit over the course of the next couple of weeks or, or just to check out online. Mm -hmm. um, well, give, give us a county, I'll give you a site if you like, um, if you want to do it that way or, or a region. Yeah, actually, let's talk a bit about the Midlands because I think yes. I've actually heard yes. uh, a bit of ads recently for... for Hidden it, Heartland. Yeah, yeah, and like definitely I think the Midlands traditionally would have been somewhere you went drive through to get to somewhere <laughs> to else. To somewhere else. So. Yeah, well, that's true. It does get overlooked, but do you know what? Some of our best monastic heritage is in the Midlands. Clon McNoise is the most famous, of course, but there's sites then like Rahan or Sikiran or um, there's this amazing, I, I, always, I always think it's kind of bonkers. There's this beautiful golden uh, shrine in a place called Boa in Offaly that was, um, commissioned by the O'Connors, and it's one of the great treasures of medieval Ireland. Uh, it was actually stolen uh, maybe five years ago and then recovered, somebody threw it in a ditch. Um, but it, it's incredible and it's just sitting hidden away in a little church. You, uh, you've got other places then like Duro, and if you go into County Leash, you also have the Rock of Dunamis, which is spectacular. Rock, that is, you know, uh, while, while we're just passing through Offaly there, I, have, I want to give an honorable mention to um, Damien, who I made the O'Crohan Man uh, yeah. series with about the bog body or Crohan man. Damien yes. does tours in the area about mm. uh, the landscape actually of or Crohan man. So yeah, if you check, good. I'll put links to that in the show notes as well, but that's really worth checking out because you get a sense of how, what was, um, um, a, a very bizarre ritual, I think, plays yes. out in a la in a very local Irish landscape. Yes, but uh, yeah, the Rocket on a Mace that is an incredible site. I'd really recommend checking that one out. Yeah, and it's, it's a the ruins of a castle. I should say I'm kind of on a a hilltop, but it's a, a really when you walk up there, it really very Lord of the Ringsy or yes, something. Yes, it it? I think, it's that's, kind of, I think that captures fantasy it. Fantasy element, yeah. Um, do you know, going up to kind of Longford, you, you know, you'd have the Carlea Trackway, this beautifully oh, preserved yeah, yeah. oak trackway, uh, and a great visitor centre there, and a, a series of important megalithic tombs like Ochnacloy Dolmen and, and stuff like that. There are a lot of people might overlook or mightn't know we're there. Uh, Midlands is absolutely packed with stuff, really, do you know? And then um, Ulster. Ulster, ah, oh, yes. Well, we did a really nice project, actually, with the Causeway Coast Borough Council, and we got to spend a lot of time around the northern coast in particular. So Dunluce Castle is probably 
you know, and the Giants Causeway would be the two big hitters there. But apart from that, you know, you have another really important megalithic tomb called Dewey's Kern. That's really nice. Uh, you have a, a really evocative, although there's very little of it left, it looks a bit like a, a bad tooth just sticking up on a, on a crag. You have Dunseverick uh, Castle there. Um, you know, the, there's Carrick a lot of, Fergus Castle is out there. Carrick Fergus, yeah, a bit further around. And then going towards Derry, you'd have uh, an awful lot there as well. You've got a lot of important monastic sites like Camus. You'd have Mount Sandal where, okay, you can't really see anything physical of the Mesolithic site, but that's our earliest settlement in the country with a large mot, uh, medieval mot in the middle as well. Um, and of course, the walled city of Derry itself is a wonderful day out you know with loads of good museums and stuff like that yeah and then we might do a quick spread across the country of more modern well when i say modern <laughs> something, built, something that was built after the year 1500 oh god now i'm on the ropes now. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is where we need damien shields talking to you uh, no absolutely there's an awful lot of kind of slightly later uh, heritage actually going back to derry uh, there's the Mussenden temple and downhill domain which was built by a, a bishop the in around the 1700s, I think. Uh, and that's spectacular because you're overlooking one of the best beaches on the northern coast. It's really, really beautiful, you know. Um, otherwise, you have a lot of kind of really interesting military heritage between various kind of uh, Martello towers that people might be familiar with, those kind of round drum shaped towers you get along the coast, uh, to places like Charles Fort down in Kinsale and James Fort across the bay from it there as They're well. 17th century fort or they? yeah they they would be kind of coming after i suppose the convulsions of the mid kind of you know the the cromwellian stuff and then the later kind of williamite stuff in the 1690s so they would be coming and kind of around in between that sort of era the the 17th century as you've well covered on your podcast was a pretty rough one yes there's a lot of military the, heritage right into that the, are they, are they the, Star shaped, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so so huge uh, collections because they're not they're not something necessarily you, you associate with um Irish history, really. Those you know, no. they, they're like they're, I think they're kind of we have stereotypes of what you go and see in Ireland, and yeah. I don't think uh, those type of fortifications really kind of come into that. Um, but there's Foynes, the Flying Boat Museum down in on Limerick, which I think gives a really nice insight into transport at the time, you know, before Shannon Airport was developed and yeah. all of that kind of thing, those yeah. early days of aviation and, and travel and the romance of that, I suppose. So, yeah, so there, there are a couple of sites for sure which are really interesting. Um, I always must say as well, county museums and our national museums are brilliant and they're free you know and they give you a really nice oversight and they're also a really good place as well sometimes to get information about what might be nearby you know if, if you're stuck if you're in Carlow for example they've got a very fine one they can point out some sites there Duckett's Grove actually in Carlow yeah. is another later site which is very uh, enjoyable to go and visit so yeah I mean you're tripping over heritage here that's the thing there's so much of it. Neil thanks a million for coming down here and sharing all that uh, the, 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 those sites uh, mm with me, what I'm going to do is go home and I'm going to pick out every site that's been mentioned <laughs> and I'll put it in the show notes below. Yeah. Will you just uh, remind people one more time about where they can, um, the exact URL for... Well, the easiest one is if they just go to either our website, which is abataheritage.ie. That's in the see... show notes, just... But, yeah, Perfect. Sorry. And that's where they'll see uh, a link to the, the membership section. Uh, or they could, you know, for a shortcut, they could go tua.ie, which is T-U-A-T-H-A. Because the whole thing is we're going to essentially form our own tour, our own community of people. And, and when we're past, hopefully not too in the distant future, when we're past all the coronavirus and stuff, we'll be doing actual tours and, and meetups and get togethers and go and see in some of these places and bring in some more of that community element. We can't buy public health restrictions as, as they are, you know, I don't want to put anyone in danger. But we hopefully will build a community of people who love this kind of stuff. They don't have to be, you know, it, it's not for total hardcore nerds, although <laughs> like they're welcome to. Um, but it's just for people who love getting out and seeing stuff that's a little bit off the beaten path, really. Hopefully it's something useful for them. Thanks a million, Neil. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Finn. Good stock. Thanks for tuning in, folks. You can find links to the places mentioned in the show in the notes below. As I said at the top of the episode, there may or may not be an episode next week, but the return of the War of Independence series is close now. So until next time, Sloan. Mm-hmm.